Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the spring of 1986, members, I was in seventh grade, and I was enthralled with the, the media that was coming across and the teasers on TV about a show that was coming up called The Mystery of Al Capone's Vaults. Now, I know many of you remember that. They were going to open up Al Capone's vaults, and they were going to find all kinds of stuff, and it was Geraldo with that goofy mustache that he had. No offense, Representative Cornish, here's his good mustache. And, and he, had a, he had a big mustache, and he had these teeth, and he was like, ah, I'm going to open the vaults. And they were going to find bodies, and they were going to find uh, all kinds of money. And so they had ta uh, agents of the Department of uh, Internal Revenue Service there, and they had a coroner there when they were going to find these bodies in the vaults, too. So this went on for weeks where this was hyped because Al Capone, of course, made all his money in the rackets, bootlegging, prostitution, uh, and gambling. And they started this show, and it was a two-hour special. And as many people here know who got suckered into watching that show, myself included, uh, they didn't find anything. Although I remember this scene after a commercial break where they came back where Geraldo Rivera was holding up a bottle of what he said was bathtub gin from Al Capone. And that was the best thing they ever pulled out of those vaults. Now, I wasn't alone in believing the hype. 30 million Americans turned, tuned into that, that two-hour special that night in the spring of 1986, believing that something was actually going to come out of these vaults that they were going to be impressed with based on the promises. And I was thinking about this, this show, when all the promises come through about what's going to happen with this bill, increasing public confidence in the election system. And I wonder about that. What do we need in public confidence? I, I was just reading, uh, Representative Kiffmeyer, your Wikipedia page, and it talked about the years that you were Secretary of State and how we led the nation in voter turnout. And it spoke with pride about how great our voter turnout was. And I, I wonder, and I still couldn't figure out, how this is actually going to increase turnout by imposing additional hoops for voters to jump through. And despite repeated attempts to find widespread fraud, we've heard nothing. So the best that can I think the uh, proponents of this bill can come up with is this handout from Representative Kiffmeyer that states, and I, I don't know what's true because it's been suggested that these numbers are grossly inflated, but let's just use these numbers on the handout as it stands. Out of all the voters uh, in the 2008 elections, uh, there were 90 convicted. And again, I don't know if that number is accurate, but let, let's just say it's accurate. That number is three thousandths of one percent of the roughly 2.8 million voters who voted in the 2008 election. Now, members, that is, if you're, if you're a, uh, an election judge at a poll on election day of 2006, your chance, um, the chance of an election judge in, in Minnesota encountering a fraudulent voter is one in 31,000. Now, the National Weather Service says your chance of being struck by lightning sometime in your life is one in 5,000. And your chance of winning four numbers on the Powerball, where you get $100, is one in 19,000. These chances are so remote, and I wonder why the tail is, being, is wagging the dog here to stuff this amendment through a hole that impacts all of Minnesota. It impacts all of us. Now, members, sometimes we create policy around here based upon remote incidents that are rare. In criminal law, I sat on, on the criminal law committees for many years, many years based on my status as a prosecutor, and sometimes one event, one high-profile event causes us to change policy, and that usually impacts the people who are charged with that crime. A very small percentage of people going forward in the future uh, to ensure that something like that never happens again. But in this instance, we're changing the law to impact every single person 
in Minnesota for something that has the odds of one in 31 thousandths of a chance of happening. And this is something we all consider to be up there with all of our constitutional rights. Now, it's been stated that, hang on a second, this, is a, this isn't a big deal. You need an ID to cash a check, to rent an apartment, to check out a library book. You probably need an ID to buy your medical marijuana in California. I'm sure you probably need an ID for that. I guess I think voting ranks a little bit higher, if not a lot higher, than all of those. And I wonder why all of a sudden we're denigrating voting to everyday commerce actions that all of us expect we have to do to get through our daily lives, but aren't something that is important to the foundations of the republic as the right to decide who leads us in this country that we call a republic. So what else do we consider really, really important that we should also have an ID for? Constitutionally, should we have an ID, it's been said, to render a political opinion? Should we have to show an ID to, in order to have an opinion on the floor here today? What about if you have an opinion on the Internet? Should you have to show an ID for that? Or with your coworkers? Should you have to show an ID to go to church? Most of us think that that's inviolate. First Amendment, freedom of religion. Do you have to show an ID to get into church? What if we made a law to say that? What about to show an ID to peaceably assemble? Now remember, this is peaceably assemble. This is not if you're doing something crazy and the cops come to say, hey, what are you doing? Peaceably assemble. Should you have to show an ID to do that? Or to have a gun in your house? Some people might think that's reasonable. But in fact, why should you have to have an ID to have a gun in your house? Now, if you're going to take it out and walk around, that's one thing. What about an, um, an ID in order to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, something we hold sacred? Cops come to your door, bang on, bang on your door, say, you know what, uh, we got a warrant. You say, well, let me see that warrant. Cop says, well, let me see your ID first. No. Constitution says we don't have to do that. They got to show you the warrant. They got to have a warrant. What about to be free from excessive bail or cruel and unusual punishment? You didn't pay your parking ticket, $100,000 bail. Well, hang on a second, Judge. No, 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 let me see your ID. These are things that you should not have to have an ID for because they're integral to our rights as a person who lives in this country. Now, in order to fan the flames of this phobia that this is so bad, this one in 31,000 chance that we should change the law and, in fact, enshrine it in the Constitution, changing the laws for all Minnesotans, we're willing to sacrifice the elderly, the poor, the disabled, college students, people who are less likely to have a current, valid, government-issued photo ID. And as has been stated by Representative Norton before, what is a valid ID? And I'll tell you right now, members, if you have lived in a different place for more than 30 days, you don't change that address. Many people are guilty of that. It's not a valid ID. State law requires you change your address within 30 days. Likewise, this further hamstrings the voting rights of members of our military. Members, I voted in every election since I turned 18, except for the times that I was on active duty orders. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I, I really tried to do that, but it's made so difficult the military mail system. You have to jump through so many hoops to do it. And I can't understand why we would pass this amendment in order to leave it up to voters to decide whether or not we want to throw up one more obstacle to our soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors. They don't need this. They don't need an additional obstacle. Now, of course, if I was going to believe this hype that we really need this amendment in order to solve that problem of a risk of 1 in 31,000, I might also believe that these obstacles that we're going to throw up are reasonable. And I think that's the point. If I believe this hype, I'll swallow the justification for those obstacles to my right to vote, and I'd willingly waste two hours of my life on a television program, but it did nothing but make money for Geraldo Rivera. And I want to point this out, that... Geraldo Rivera later wrote in his 1991 auto autobiography, exposing myself, ironically, that in the wake of this show, this hype, 
that he threw up that everyone believed that nothing came of. This was his statement. He said, my career was not over, I knew, but had just begun. All because of a silly, high-concept stunt that failed to deliver on its titillating promise. Members, the titillating promise here is that somehow this is going to solve the hobgoblin of voter fraud for the citizens of Minnesota. But we're denigrating a right that so many of us hold very dear in the face of that, that we should not do. Constituents and citizens in my district are going to be desperately impacted by this amendment. And I think it's a prospect that members who support this amendment should consider in the future years. As has been stated, you may win this year, but you'll lose in every election after that. Because citizens see that our priorities are disenfranchisement, not the priorities we should be working on, which is jobs, education, and a decent and fair place to live here and work in Minnesota.